Oh, it is. How are you, mate? I'm good. How are you? Right. I'm just, yeah, really good. I was going to post a quick thing in here <clears> so we, people can get your hashtag, your tag. Uh, ground going like ground locomotion, ground based movement with a natural life stylist. Yeah, we cover a bit of rewilding feet as well, and maybe and take it into you know, a, a real primary locomotive pattern that should be running right. Amazing. Yeah. Tony, give the guys a little bit of context around um, your background for those people that haven't heard of you. Um, tell them a little bit about the lockdown leg as well. I guess you, I mean, your recovery, mate. I imagine you are like, like a spring chicken again today. No no fatigue or anything. Oh, I'm good, man. I'm good. Well, I've got four kids. There's no, no <laughs> opportunity to be moaning, man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a luxury. Um, those days are gone. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm Tony Riddle. I'm known as a natural lifestyleist. What does that mean? Um, I started off as a rewilding coach. Done many backgrounds, personal training, Pilates, and then found ourselves in a facility where we brought in natural movement. And the natural movement then evolved into looking at the human health, I guess, as a holistic approach rather than just movement being a modality of our physical self. And then from there, it expanded into rewilding. And then finally, kind of the, the Time Style magazine approached me and said they wanted to do a piece on best um coaches and of course my ego is like yeah this is amazing six best coaches Woo-hoo. um <laughs> but then the conversation as it unraveled she could soon see that it wasn't just about um running or locomotion it was it was again it was a holistic approach we started to talk about you know what does what does it mean rewild and she couldn't quite understand and i said well if you think about the human gut and we understand microbiome and we're now, we, there must be a template in order for us to understand what it is to have a, a, a natural gut. Otherwise, how would we understand it? What would be the, the appropriate diversity? And then I said, oh, well, we look to tribes of today and beings of today that are living in nature to assess what natural biome would be. And then that gives us a template. So then I said, sleep. Okay, how do we know about sleep rather than a laboratory? Ah, we can look to nature. And when we do that, we can see, ah, that's, that's natural sleep. You want to understand how to get your sleep where it should be? Well, look to nature. And then how we move yes. and how we play and, and food and all of that is available to us in nature. So then she was like, oh, wow, this is amazing. It's a much bigger piece. And then suddenly it turned into, ah, well, really, you're, it's a lifestyle thing and you're bringing nature in. Well, that's the natural lifestyleist. So it kind of switched in that moment, really, just a branding shift. Nice. And with that, so did my Instagram account. It just kind of went, bam, suddenly ignited. And I think it's partly the language at that time. Now we hear more about rewilding, reconnecting and all of that. But go back three or four years and people weren't kind of on that path yet. So um, yeah. that's, that's where it came in. Of course, through that and through the journey, I, I've just, keep looking for ways of living that are more in sync with human biology like living on the ground or you know looking at lighting in the home or air purification just trying to bring in as many natural norms into whatever our social norm is and we can all understand that today because we suddenly had our social norms swipe beneath our feet it was gone in a moment right we all woke up and we're in lockdown but hopefully that created a space in amongst our cluttered up consciousness to say ah change and what's the most important thing? What's it highlighted? Ah, health and lifestyle and well-being. Yeah. And so with, with that, it's like it doesn't matter what the social norm, we should always be checking in with what those natural norms are. And so for me, I can, you know, some people think it might be a bit extreme to go and run barefoot for miles upon end, or they might think it's a bit extreme to go into ice baths or cold immersion, to which I have to say is like an, an environmental generational amnesia at that point because it's a mere baby on the evolutionary calendar isn't it that we've had hot water hot baths hot showers and cushioning (laughs) on our shoes you know so it's kind of like well wash before that right we just used to like just be dirty all the time (laughs) yeah well that was that you know that was the saying about um you know about the don't chuck the baby out with the bath water or whatever it is because the bath water got really dirty by the time the youngest one was in there And you could literally mistake the baby in the dirty water. It's kind of that. But imagine the microbiome (laughs) that would have been going on, how diverse it would have been compared to where it is now. Um, So that's kind of the, that's that's beneath it. It's just, again, trying to find ways of living that are more in sync with human biology. And then, and then bringing those forward and just trying again to bring as many natural norms in. And so that going where we're leading into what I think was, you asked about the lockdown leg. Yeah, I, I introduced the lockdown leg 
this weekend, which is a uh, which was a, which is still going on. It's a hundred mile um, ultra, but it's like a relay. Well, you can enter it as a single person or up to six people, and it was a virtual relay, so it was an opportunity for people that maybe trained for the mar- marathon um that dropped it and it's not happening now till october or like myself i was meant to be running in may i was going to do the three peaks i was going to run the three peaks challenge which is normally um snowden scarfield pike and ben nevis and you do all three in um 24 hours and they would drive you between each peak so i decided well i'm going to put my own spin on that and i'm going to run it so i thought i'd run all the the road work and the three peaks so that's a total of 485 yeah. miles and then I hadn't really thought about other than I'm just going to do it in nine days I thought about the three and the nine it came together really nice it was about transformation and then I started to look in oh who's done it before and someone's the record is nine days 11 hours so we're going for a record on it on this one um and that's of course. It's, it's, <laughs> it's like I think that's like two marathons a day so it's 52 miles a day um, for nine consecutive days, but with three mountains thrown into the mix as well. Um, so, of course, nice. well, what am I doing if I'm not training for that now? And we dropped it. So I, I wanted to organize an event, as I say, for myself and for other runners out there and to bring a collect, kind of that collective energy together. And, we, and, and the, more, the more we put into it, the, it, the easier it got. It was like, oh, wow, we can just use the social platform. We can create, oh, we can use Insta Live like this to do handovers so people can actually see it was like a virtual handover of a baton and then the next person runs. Yeah. So in total, it's, if you broke it down into the six, it should be, it would be like 16.7 miles each individual would run. And then, um, and th- yeah, and then it, of course, within your 24 hours, you complete your 100 miles. And it doesn't matter where you are on the globe doing that, which is also quite fantastic, you know. Um, yeah. So that's been the lockdown leg. Um, and it's been great. It's been really lovely. We had a great team. I had a happy pair involved. Richie, you had on earlier. So Richie Northam yeah. was on there. That was great. Um, Adrian, Moson, Stars, um, and a great team behind it, organizing it as well. And then all the people, the participants. So the idea is that we not only run, there's an entry fee for running. So each individual of a team would put £20 into a central GoFundMe pot. Yeah. And along with that, they put a, don- a nominated charity in. The nominated charity goes in, the funds go in, and then they can also fundraise. So we were like raising funds outside that. Um, I think two thousand we were looking for from the from the spectator audience kind of thing, mm-hmm. um, or right. our followers, or our followers. And then the winner isn't the winner the fastest time; it's the name that gets drawn out of the hat. So we're doing a draw on Tuesday evening. Um, Jack, my friend Jasmine Hemsley's doing that. She picked the name out of the hat of the winning charity, and that charity gets the whole GoFundMe pot, oh, which cool. is a really nice way of doing it, you know? Yeah, yeah, pretty cool, man. Very cool. Right, let's get stuck into a little bit of uh, the session plan then. So, when you sent me through this stuff, uh, I think it was yesterday, you, know, you finished it off and going, We've only got 45 minutes, haven't we? <laughs> I was like, Yeah, this is going to be like, this is going to be amazing because there's so much good stuff we could go through. And we sort of I'm going to let you, I'm going to hand over to you, Ted. I'm going to follow along. I'm excited to see what you're going to take people through. Hopefully people at home, if they've got some space, they don't need any equipment for this, right? They can follow along, get moving a little bit, and then take some of this stuff away and start thinking how they're going to implement it. That's always kind of our call to action. I guess similar for you is like, learn something and then do something with it. That's the, the, the action part of it. So over to you. Absolutely. So um, I am an advocate of ground living. So we don't have any furniture in our, any furniture, sitting furniture in our house. And um, why is that? Again, if we go into the natural beings of the world, we see that they don't sit in chairs. Um, and, and where I've been out running yesterday, you know, put 25.1 miles in there. And how, to, how, how can you be really efficient and get up and move like you can the next day is simply by going back to understanding what it is natural beings or running beings of the world are doing. So they can, you know, we're talking about ultra running. That's, that's all they do, right? It's the running kind of species or the running tribes of today, let's call them, the running peoples of today. Yes, lads, Richie Norton. Hey, bro. Um, <laughs> so if we then, if we, if we look at what it is, what it is they're doing, well, firstly, they have a really wild posture. So they have an upright posture. Their head, their chest, their pelvis is stacked. They don't sit in chairs, right? They also don't wear compromising footwear. So for me, it's always been about, right, how do I rewild that, that running style? We simply we rewild the posture and we rewild the feet. So the first stage of posture would be the foundations for me, which is the human foot. So each one of these babies has like, you know, 33 joints, 26 bones, over 100 muscles, tendons, and ligaments. 
And every one of those serves its role and purpose to feeding the appropriate shape above it. Born to run, yes, bro. So you can imagine um, there's per certain leverage points in the human foot. So the big toe and this ball of the foot is like four times denser and thicker than all the other toes. So we call that like a leverage and a pivoting point. But that's the shape of it. Modern footwear has moved it over here, right? So the moment that happens, the leverage and pivoting point of the human foot is off. Therefore, we create something which we know as um, overpronation. So the big toes kind of, the anchor isn't there. So you get this micro little adjustment in the ankle in human gait. So in our primary locomotive position, which we should be running as we're a running species, um, you have um, two times your body weight in ground reaction forces, right? So that means like you and I are standing here, right? Sitting here right now, standing. That's one times your weight. I'm about 78 kilos right now. When I'm running, that's two times my body weight. So if that shape is out and the, ankle and the anchorage is out, it means the ankle gets thrown out with two times body weight, then the knee, then the hip, and then the shape above it would be compromised. But you have to imagine all the micro muscular and tendon actions that, that are there to try and support that level of dysfunction. Therefore, we wake up the next day after miles and miles of the same little tweaks. I basically say that, you know, Tweak your movement, don't let your movement tweak you. So tweak it until you've rewilded it and refined it. Otherwise, that movement will tweak you. And that's the niggles and the injuries or the discomfort yeah. the next day. Like, oh, my God, I can't walk. I, my calves are blown up, my quads. And really, we should be able to get out of bed and, and go and do it again, which is what I had to do today, right? So it should be that same kind of, right, experience, provided you have the, <coughs> the right shape so that you can deal with forces. So if we can start maybe with feet, right? That'd be a good place to yeah, start. Yeah. Right? I think I need to just change this slightly, like, this angle on here, get you down at floor oh, level. No. You ignore my head right now. So this is the foot, right? So we very simply, you're going to use nature's toe separators, which are your fingers, and you place one finger in between that toe, one between that one, one between that one, between that one. Very simply. So this is like, we call it toga, this whole series, right? Or rewilding the feet in this instance. Right, so we're going to basically create a really nice, smooth circular pattern from the foot and the ankle like this, can see. So I'm almost holding and bracing this ankle above my knee, and then I circle the ankle. First joint, you know, go into the ankle and separate the toes, and then we can start to break up each individual knuckle of the foot. So if we do, say, what, 10 circles one, one way, nice and smooth. Now, if you find an area that's sticky or sensitive, just pass over it again. You know, one thing that, over that I think a lot of people will struggle with doing this for the first time is they'll find it uncomfortable just having their, their toes separated like that. And that's a, yeah. a really third starting point of going, this is how kind of dysfunctional your feet have become because you squashed them into shoes. And now the toes are all stuck together. It's going to be painful for a bit, potentially, while we start to separate that back. Yeah, and if you understand the language of, of function, and function follows form, right? So the form of the human foot is actually a, a foot-shaped foot. And if we create a shoe-shaped foot, we've already created a deformity, right? So if we think of, that means we end up with dysfunction. So if you imagine function follows form, we have a deformed foot because of footwear, we have dysfunction. So it's really important to get back in and just yeah, get the grounding, the anchors right, that stable point to build your, you know, I, I, I'm a strong believer in 80 wild, connected, empowered beings. And part of that is having a superstructure. But what's beneath a superstructure is earthquake foundations, right? You know, you have to put the foundations in. So that's 10 each way, nice and simple, right? Next one is to break the foot up. So I'm creating this kind of torsion, can you see? I'm just roll, wrap, yeah. um, re like, almost like I'm wringing out the foot, you're twisting it, right? So you just twist up. And that will start to break up the foot a little bit. Now, you might be thinking, oh, I'm going to be really sensitive here. Your feet, if you're running, for instance, dealing with two times your body weight, you, you don't have to be so compassionate with your feet, you know? Showing them, a, you know, <laughs> showing them a bit of discomfort actually will build comfort over time. So just, um, yeah, break them up a little. And we just start to get that ringing out effect, just that turning over of the knuckles. So I'm passing the big knuckle over, little toe under, and that ringing out of the foot. It was good. Yeah, it's nice, sir, just to break the feet up. Shut them yeah. love. Right, okay. First one. Then we're going to grab... Um, so I'm going to go first knuckle here, big toe, and the, small, and the one below it. And I'm just going to try and play. So I'm 
one is going up, one is going down. So again, I'm just creating some space in between the first knuckle, second knuckle. First metatarsal head, second one. And then I move up second and third. There we go. Third and fourth. Fourth and fifth. Fifth and sixth. Only kidding. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, from there, I grab the big toe, and I pull the big toe back like that with that finger. See that? That shape? My chimp, yeah. my chimp feet. So from there, I then put my thumb into my arch, just where there's a huge... There's a trigger point that we can find in the heel there. I want you to go from that point, just, just at the top of the, beneath the heel, and I'm going to pull it into my arch up to the ball of my foot. You see that? Yeah. So I'm actually using the pressure that's, being, that's coming through me pulling my toe to use that to pull into my ball of the foot there. Yeah. Yeah, so we get that nice massage into the arch and break the arch up a bit. And that's essentially the planty surface of the foot where you might experience, again, a bit of tension. So just use your thumb to work along that lovely structure again. And this so is what support. people will find if they get plantar fasciitis or they're getting pain in the feet. This stuff underneath the foot just become like rock solid, right? It doesn't move anymore. Causes well, yeah. the you have to understand that, you know, the foot is incompre incredibly compliant and strong, right, when it needs to be. So it should be able to go soft and it should be able to go stiff when it needs to be, right? So when it's off the ground, it should be floppy. When it lands, bam, it should be on. And those like 33 joints, 26 bones, 100 muscles, tendons, and ligaments have a purpose and a role. And there's also 200,000 extra receptors in this, which is equivalent to what you have in your hands. When you put anything above, say, three millimeters on your foot, we start to dumb down the sensory pathways of the foot, but also the cushioning wipes out your own ability to be soft and compliant because the footwear is doing it for you. Mm. So the foot loses its innate function of how to be stiff and compliant when it needs to be you know so that's how we end up with then rigid arches and then from a rigid arch most people perceive they have they're like flat or they've been prescribed with flat feet it's not they have a rigid arch and then the ankle collapses because the arch is too rigid so it creates a collapsed ankle a collapsed ankle is very different to a flat foot so that's so simple right so first stage just that um we do it on the other side here so we know right so i'm going to go again this one little finger toe Next one, next one, nature's toe separators. I'll go a bit slow on this one because I appreciate it might be a bit difficult to get your knuckles in, especially if you've got fat fingers like mine. So that's it. <laughs> so just go in, breaking the foot up again. Okay, so we're going to create that nice, ee, smooth circle there. So if you may, maybe have a heavy lifting session or you've gone out for a run, afterwards just spend a bit of time on your feet. Yeah? Just open them up again. If you're wearing footwear that's narrow in the toe box, um, do the work outside of it, but then maybe start to finger out, ah, oh, I'm dealing with loads of symptoms at the moment, right? Like um, it could be trigger points in the peroneals. It could be runner's knee, ITB, hip issues. What you might find is actually coming from the foundation, the feet. Yeah. So rather than keep dealing at symptom level, why not go to the cause and start to wear footwear that at least enables your feet to behave like feet and we'll return them back to having a foot shape. If you get a piece of paper and a pen <clears throat> and place your foot onto it, and you simply <clears throat> draw around it, right? So say that's there, I'm gonna draw around my foot, boom, 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 with a marker pen. And then I'm gonna get all my footwear, I'm gonna put it on top of it, and I'm gonna draw around my footwear. <laughs> and if I can't get my toes into that footwear, you need to get rid of them because, again, that's throwing everything out, you know? So you just think of that, that it's always about that alignment level. Um, any tips on first aid on the trail for barefoot running? <clears throat> well, let's get, let's get through this first. So, there we go. Right, so that's it. So that's the ankle circles, 10 each way. And then, again, um, this torsion. So twisting, one under, one over. One under, one over. Well, that's what Simple. I'm quite interested Tony, about some of this stuff. I'm married to a South African. And, um, <clears throat> They grow up, um, and she says, like, they don't wear schools all the way through, uh, sorry, they don't wear shoes all the way through primary school. So they only really have to put shoes on for daytime when yeah. they went to secondary school, age, what, 12, 13 years old. And yeah. you see, when you go there now, you see just kids that are of that age or younger than 12, they're all barefoot. And the, yeah. the amount of work that, they, that you do, the positive work that you must do during those development years in terms of creating strong feet. I mean, they play rugby, they do athletics, everything, all their sport is done. Um, barefoot, but we're, we're in a culture where we just put shoes on straight away and it's, well, that's what you do. You have to wear shoes when you go out of the house, right? 
Yeah, but we're also in a culture where we're spending most of our time in physios, osteopaths, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pilates, yoga. Again, I used to have a Pilates studio. I'm really well, well hurt. Well, it's, it used to be that everyone would turn up at the door. They drive to the studio. They'd wear, leave their compromising footwear at the door and then come in and do the session and expect to unravel all the ills of their lifestyle in the session. Yeah. And you deal with it. You just deal with it at symptom level. But then they go back to the door, put the shoes on, walk to the car. By the time they got back to the car, because of the footwear and the behaviors of the feet, they're already triggering the body, already putting loads of inappropriate action in, and then sitting in the car and driving home for a day of sitting, right? So it's really just, you know, it's like, almost like that wake up of, well, if I actually do this work, I should be able to just get up again and go and do the same thing, you know? Yeah. So that's the circles. Okay, next one, we grab the big toe. And then I hold, again, thumb into arch, and it pulls all the way up to the knuckle. That's great. How long would it take to doing this stuff to, to start to see a difference or feel a difference in the, in the mobility and function of the feet? This, well, this is just the first, this is the first stage of it. So I, I like to think that adaptation can occur like within 72 hours, six weeks. But the thing yeah. is, if you go, keep going back to that drawing round of the shoes, that conversation, if the toe box is too narrow, it's going to take a lot longer, isn't it? Because if you were spending eight hours in a pair of um, narrow toe box shoes with a heel behind them, and you're going to spend an hour on your feet trying to unravel that, good luck with it. You know, it's almost like, yeah. it's, again, it's just dealing at symptom level. If you change the footwear and change the pattern and do the work, and you can put stuff like this in, right? These are... These are cool. These are like really soft, compliant um, toe separators. So that would go over the big toe like that. And that's the next one. What are they called? I've seen a few people they're using just, those. What, what's... These are just, they're cool. They're, I think these are called Valgo Fix or something. But they're toe separators. The best ones I've found because they're just silicon and they're really soft. Um, you yeah. get two in a pack and it also comes with a big toe corrector, right? So I can put a link in for those. So that already Great. puts the big toe where it should be. If you have a really stiff big toe, it might still be here, but at least it's on the path to recovery. And then you do the toe work to go with it. With these, um, if I just wear them when I'm resting, it's almost, it's, 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 you, defeat the sub, you defeat the object, really. If you're standing in them, there's one times your weight. If you walk in them, it's still one times your weight. But if you put these and you've got wide enough shoes to run in, you're then delivering two times your body weight. And we know what strength conditioning does, right? So if you strengthen yourself with good form, that form will get stronger in the position it's in. If you get stronger with a deformity, you'll get stronger in the shape of the deformity. Yeah. So I would put these in for like loading and lifting. Like if you're lifting, get toe separators in because the big toe is four times denser and thicker than all the other toes. It's an amazing loading structure. And if you think of a lifting, Olympic lifting shoes, they have a big wedge behind them, don't they? And that wedge pops you forward. Where does it deliver you? Oh, into the toe box, into the front of the foot. <clears throat> but at the same time, your lifting shoes need to be wide. So I think do wins. I think do wins or do wins. They're like an amazing lifting shoe because they're actually quite wide in the toe box. Whereas if you look at brands like Adidas, they're still going down this crazy roll of having a narrow toe box. It doesn't add up really to the lifting discipline. Yeah. So that's the first one, right? Okay, next one. Um, sorry, guys. You're just going to get my ankles and my feet now. Next stage, the big toe. I'm going to roll my big toe over like that. Can you see that? Yep. So I'm delivering. I'm opening up this first knuckle in that shape. The rest of the toes, I'm actually trying to pull them up. So I'm actually making this, I'm delivering a conversation where these are separate. This is being identified as an, as an axis of leverage. And this is an axis of balance. So imagine these were like, this is worth four units. And this was worth one unit each. If I'm on a rail, I separate like that between the toes and I get perfect balance because this side of the foot is equal to this side of the foot. That makes sense? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. So if you're balancing. So we're going to separate those two. First one, big toe knuckle. Um, rather than give you um, more things to do in an already overwhelmed day, just do this whilst you're brushing your teeth. You know, so simple. You can be there standing. If you believe what your dentist says, then you've got like three or four minutes there, right? First one. Next one, I roll the smaller knuckles over. But then I'm still popping this one. And this is an opportunity to open up all those lateral ligaments through the ankle there. All that tension that we get throughout the day, just open up the ankle and the toes. Roll them out as far as you can. Now, what you need to do now is just pop that big toe up as high as you can. And allow the ankle you to try... roll. 
Yeah, so you allow yourself to go into pan deflection there, Tony, to allow yourself to kind of put yeah, your toes a little bit. Exactly. Yeah, so I'm super, I'm supernated and planty flex. Yeah? Yeah. Kind of that expression. That's it. And then yeah. poking the big toe out. That's great. Lovely. Okay. Next one. Big toe. Next foot. Again, big toe. Big toe tucked under. Then again, separating. This time, I want to load just this knuckle. So I'm not hinging out and I'm not rolling in. I'm just trying to go through this. Work. Imagine that's like one shaft at the moment you want to work down. You see that? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So then again, it could be 30 seconds, could be a minute, whatever time you have. And then roll the foot over. And again, we poke the big toe out. So if any of you is kind of getting into barefoot running or barefoot footwear, I know that sounds like an oxymoron, but it is barefoot footwear. Um, start, yeah, really breaking up the feet. And again, after your runs or after a lifting session or a movement session, get straight back in the feet again. Joseph Fruchek from um, Fighting Monkey. Great delivery. It's like every hour you spend on your feet training, every hour you spend in the gym training, spend the same time on your feet. And if someone's listening to this, Tony, they've got, they wear insoles now for the, because they've been told they need some corrective footwear. What's your advice to those, those people? Um, if you keep padding out your feet by wearing corrective footwear and orthotics, they're going to further devolve. So would you just advise people to take them out straight away or is there, is there a transition they need to think about? I don't go with transitions. I just go with doing the work. So I kind of remove the, pad, <laughs> yeah. remove, the, remove the padding and the arch support and start to get into removing the footwear that put you in that position in the first place. Yeah. The crazy notion of wearing orthotics in narrow toe box shoes that put you in the orthotics in the first place. That's how crazy <laughs> yeah. that world of podiatry can be. It's like if you put an orthotic inside a rubberized shoe and you have an o and a collapsed ankle, what happens is the rubber in the shoe carries on further decompressing so you still end up with an overpronated or collapsed ankle but with an orthotic in it which creates even more of a rigid arch so it's kind of just yeah. uh, it's just the language around it you have to understand that right if i remove that and i just put the work in but that's the thing it takes work and it takes discipline and it takes showing up each day like all the work but i think again this time has highlighted more than ever isn't it that it's about doing the work it's about doing the inner work and part yeah. of the inner work is prepping the physiology because if you prep the physiology, you have a strong vessel and then we can go deeper in all the other work that we're looking at. So, um, okay, so that's that. So there. Next one. I want you to load the big toes and this kind of first knuckle again. And then I want you to have a go at popping the smaller toes up. Can you see that? So, yeah. so I can load the first knuckle but lift the smaller knuckles. So now you're flat. So you put both feet flat on the ground. There you go. Have a look at my toes now. Can you see that? So I'm lifting the smaller toes, but loading the big toes. Yeah, got it. Yeah? I'm going to find this one hard, I think. Yeah, it's tough, this. It's just to start with, though, but it's like anything, you know? So don't roll, don't roll the big toes over. Just put your feet flat. Completely okay. flat. Okay. Yeah? That's it. Yes. And then, yeah. Now, what you might find is that the ankle, as you're, lo as you're t pulling the smaller ones up, the ankle might uh, start to pronate. Like yeah. that, you start to get that behavior. So what I want you to do is take all your weight forward and take, take the weight out of the heel. So the heel is like an experience of being able to slide an A4 piece of paper underneath it. That makes sense? So it's a yeah. very light heel. So put two-thirds of your weight in the front of your foot and then put that two-thirds into your big toes as you lift the smaller toes up. And then when you place them back down, you soften again. So think of it like this. Big toes and balls of feet are worth four units. Yeah. Smaller toes are worth one unit each. So yeah. four units, one, two, three, four, eight units, and four in the heel. Yeah. So whenever you're standing, try and keep going back into that message that this is worth four units, these are worth one each, and this is worth four. Yeah. So that gives you the understanding, right? You don't want to be loading your heels when you're standing. Go into the anchors, the big toes. Yeah. And then once that's there, lift up. Okay, so that's very simple. That's the first stages. How funny is a neuro pattern of this sort of stuff when you try and do it on your toes and your fingers start moving? Like, I love yeah. it. <laughs> you know, well, it goes back to, you know, if you understand the quadrupedal phase, then that, that explains a lot there, right? Yeah. That's it again, so we can lift the, lift the smaller toes up, big toes will harm you. Right, next one. I'm going to pivot. So I'm going to load the big toe of this one and the ball, lift the smaller toes, and I'm going to try and keep that anchor down as I turn the heel in. And what that will do is it will create more and more space between the first and second toe. Can you see it? So I just yeah. pivot the heel. Now, I'm, I'm, 
that's all coming from my hip. So I use the glute or the hip joint to turn the heel. Got it, yeah. Yeah? Got it, Tim? That's it. So yeah. loading the big toe. Use the hip to turn. So it's not like I'm rotating my whole pelvis. I'm just trying to think of the yeah. ball and the socket. But the, the hip is it's like the ball and socket. Yeah, so it's just pivoting like that. We just turn. Yeah. Think. Okay, so we do 10. I said, Laura's come on and said, loving that I can do something better than Tim. That's not what it's about, Laura. It's not a competition about who's got the best feet. <laughs> <laughs> it's about the taking part. Come on. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so that's, so that's, that's kind of the, that's the, that's where I'd go. So breaking up the feet first, mobilizing the big toes, then the smaller toes, and then starting to really separate the two. Now, I don't have a broom handle here. But if you had a broom handle, you put the broom on the ground and you stand on it one leg as if the broom is underneath between the first and second toes. Right, sorry about this, guys. Here we go. Uh, okay, yeah, I know what you mean. I'll get one. Do you have a broom? Ah, we have one here. There we go. Brilliant. Super. Let's see if I can take that off. Yes. Right, can you see this? Here we go. Excellent, Tim. Right, okay, so you see this? So I'm now separating the first and second knuckles. So my smaller toes, the four units are here and four units this side. Can you see yeah. that? Okay, then the heel is just in a direct line. Then what you do is you, try and, you may need another support, but you're looking to balance your body weight on there like that. Oh, nice. Between the first and the second toe. Now, if you find that your little toes are going onto the ground, pop them up. And try and again balance the weight evenly. So you, the big toe is one side, the smaller toes the other. And this then you can then upgrade this or translate it into balancing work and go up higher on rails or beams. But go yeah. go beyond footwear. Try and get it naked, butt naked feet, right? So you get that sensory feedback, but also you start to understand the behaviour of a gripping foot. So this is essentially a, a gripping foot, isn't it? The thumb this side and toes this side. And that's what I'm looking to replicate in the foot. I want the big toe one side. And what you start to do is open up these, fir these first and second knuckles and we start to reestablish this is an axis of leverage and this is an axis of balance. And that then will feed ankle behavior, yeah? And off that I can get more dorsiflexion. Dorsiflexion then is applicable to squatting, it's applicable to walking, it's applicable to running. So that's the first foundation. So that's all the footwork. Next one would be kneeling. Um, kneeling practices. Let's see if I can change this. Get more of me in the shot. How are you doing that, man? What kind of camera are you on there? How are you doing this? Uh, I've got them on a tripod and elevated. So, uh, How's that? that? That works, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah we have both. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, kneeling. Um, the prize position for me in groundwork or working into a standing posture is a squat, right? So a nice flat-footed human squat like that with a great, you know, a strong posture, lovely straight back, you know, and flat feet, okay? But the weight's still in the front. Great squat, man. But what's the foundation of that? How do we get there? And we're fortunate. We ground live and we have like four kids now. So I get to see all their micro movements on the ground the whole time. And it's fantastic to watch because they're incredibly fluid and soft. Now, Tulula, because she's, she's like the third one, so she's, we got to see her, all the ground living movements without any chair sitting at all. And then you, you suddenly see all the micro elements or micro um, skills of the macro skill of squatting. And then squatting becomes a macro skill, but it's a micro skill of how you stand. Yeah. Then you walk, then you run, then you balance, and you jump, you lift, and all those other disciplines come off the ground rest position. So with the kneeling work, this is like a micro skill of the macro skill of squatting. How, what do I mean by that? So this is a kneeling position, but it is also a single legged squat, right? So yeah. this is no different to that. Yeah, the shape of it. Does that make sense? So I'm looking to um, create dorsiflexion in this lead ankle here. So for those that um, maybe can't get to a flat footed squat yet, kneeling work and keep kneeling in so that this knee, you want to lean it in and over the, heel, over the big toe without popping the heel up. If you don't have that level of dorsi, if you don't have the level of dorsiflexion yet, you can start here. Yeah. Yeah, and then over time, you go further back. Yeah, great. Love it. 
Does that make sense, man? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just the only thing I was going to say was that like we did um, when Ollie Frost was on this morning, we were in this exact same position, and he was using some isometrics to help to build some strength and pushing the knee over the toes. Just yeah. nice how it all kind of fits in together. It's great. Yeah, exactly. So then, so this again would overlap into how we squat, right? Then we have this where we can start to think, right? Okay, I'm going to want to break the ankle up some more. So I'm going to allow the ankle to break. Boom, first. Then I'm going to open the hip. And this feeds the intricate system again of understanding that ankles are mobile, hips are mobile, and knees are incredibly stable. What we don't want is torsion in the knees. The more rigid my ankle, the more torsion in the knee. The more, more tension in the hip, the more movement in the knee. So it's really get as much mobility in here and here as you can. Another great feeding one for that is this, just simply rolling the ankle. And we roll with the ankle first, then the hip. And the knee's just the middle man. I'd go try and think of this, Tim. It's, you feel that the foot, the ankle moves first. There's a rolling of the, yeah, go with that first. Yeah, and then go. And then go. Right, now what we can do is we do a few little warm-ups like that, and then we're going to go. Boom. And that creates a shin box. So I'm here. I lean this way, and I just roll the ankle out. Boom. And then I can pop yeah. back up again. Rolling. Boom. Popping back up again. Rolling. Now, rather than go with it, so this is my huge weight, the head and the chest. Boom, I fall that way. I'm going to move this way. There you go, and then you can softly place it down. Boom. See the difference? Immediately, yep. you can only really observe this in kids. They're like, incre it's, just, it's innate in them. They're just really soft and fluid. And again, yeah. the more weight I put here, the more tension I get here, the less mobility and flexibility. If I distribute my weight differently, the more mobile I'm going to become. Go okay, simple, right? So that's it. So we yeah. can go kneeling. This one, again, we can lean in. Um, another one that you can be doing from this position from the kneel is to think about pulling the foot up to the shin, like in a tempo. So I'm actually trying to pull the bridge of the foot up to meet the shin and then dropping it back down again. It's like a little pulse. Yeah. See this? Boom, 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 yeah. boom. And that will, again, strengthen the pathway of dorsiflexion. So it's not always about the flexibility you're going to get in the back of the leg here. I also need the strength to be able to hold it there, right? So that dorsiflexion and that tapping will help. It will stimulate the tip anterior, really. Okay, so that's tapping. And then we can simply switch. To switch, I look at this. I roll the ankle first. Boom. That's it. I then take this back leg and I sweep it round and I bring it here. Yep. Show, I'll show it again. Hold on, Tim. I'll show you again. So I'm here. I roll this one over. Yeah. Boom. This back leg sweeps round, uh, got you. comes yep. here, and then I simply pop up again. Cool. And then you roll. Roll, roll, roll. Yeah, now bring the back leg round, bring it in front of the shin. So we were here. We're here now. Uh, this shape. I bring this foot here. Yep. Boom. Yeah. Pop up. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Sit here, so I'm gonna come here that way. Yeah, now pop up. Hey, yeah, almost <laughs> yeah. there. There you go. And then again, we can repeat the same thing leaning into the knee, opening up the lead ankle. We can then pulse with the ankle, just building up that again in the shin. Nice tempo there, lifting the chest, lifting the head, pulsing through the ankle. That's great. Okay, back into double leg kneeling like this. So all of that leading to kneeling. So I'm now in this shape. Great opportunity to get more planty flexion in the ankles again. So I open up the ankle just the same. I can, from here, I can go up, tuck my toes under, and I go back into a heel sit. So again, more flexibility then in the toes. And what I don't want you to do is sit and collapse into it. I want you to be upright, like a wild posture again, thinking of the head, the chest, and the pelvis being stacked. From there, I can go up. I can flatten the feet again, go back. Boom. As one. And that really strong... Again, strong, upright posture. So not collapsing. Excellent, right? So we go up as one. Toes under. Heel sitting. Up again, planty flexed. Nice, man. And try and break a little bit more in the hip. Yeah. So think of that as a really lovely hip hinging discipline. At the top, you can think glutes and then hinging from the hip again. Lovely. Yeah. So it's all one, yeah. Imagine that, mecha it's mechanical, isn't it? Thinking of yeah. the ball and socket of the hip and then the structure remaining really strong. Okay, from here, I'm going to go here, back into a hill sit and then pop up into like a perch squat. Yeah. 
yay, which I like to think of like a posture squat. So this helps feed the shape again. Now I'm going to lower my knees, but to do that, I want to take this huge weight <clears throat> and lean back. So I'm actually placing my knees down, not banging them on the ground. Okay, so just leaning back as you lower them. Think how softly you can get them down. And we, do, we can do like reps like that, you know, and again, you're just increasing the mobility where? In your toes as well, as well as hips. And again, getting an understanding of how much the head will affect the pressure of the knees. So if I haven't organized my posture and my head's forward, bam, I'll come crashing down. It's a very good self-coaching tool for understanding about the behaviors of segments, you know? Yeah. Okay, so that's that. So we can go up, feet flat, drop. Up, toes under. Pop up, now stand. And when you're standing, I want you to think about those units of weight, four in the big toe, one in each smaller toe on the heel, and then we're gonna drop back down again, allow the heel to pop up. Lift the chest, lift the head, lower the knees. Yeah, up again, planty flex. Sitting back, hinging from the hips. Pop up again. Heel sitting, up, popping up, lift the chest, lift the head, and stand. So nice. simple. So that's like yeah, taking you from single leg kneeling, double leg kneeling, into squatting, and then into standing, and then understanding that that ultimately is the, the shape, or the understanding of the wild shape, is the head, the chest, and the pelvis, always being stacked above your base of support. And running is no different to that. So if you run and you chase your head when you're running, like we end up with a um, head chasing posture like this, and I'm folding from the hip, okay? The further forward yeah. my head goes, the further forward my foot has to go out in front of me. Otherwise, I'd simply fall over, right? So the further forward the foot goes, the longer I have to deal with forces because I'm on the ground for longer. So if you can try and think about when you're running, keep your feet underneath you the whole time. Mm. Almost forget you have feet, but just try and think about them always being, un or the ankle is underneath you at least. And that's a really <clears> interesting <throat> point around the footwear, isn't it? Because we've been taught by big padded soles that we can overstride and therefore taking a lot of weight through the heel. As soon as you shift to more of a barefoot style, your stride length becomes shorter. And then it's a bit more about the cadence and the foot planting of where the foot hits the ground. Yeah, and the more you refine that, the more you understand there's, there's really one pose or one shape we all need to get to. And it looks yeah. very different, okay? So it looks more like, let's try and get some range in here now. Um, yeah, it's like yeah, this. Good, yeah. So that's the shape that I'm looking for when I'm running. And I literally go, Tim, from this shape, bam, to this shape, bam, mm -hmm. to this shape, to this. What I'm trying to do is minimize all of this stuff to get to there, because everyone has to get to that position. They, we all have to get there, but it's how we choose to get there. And if we spend too long on the ground, you're dealing, simply dealing with forces for far too long. And the yeah. longer you have to deal with forces, the more inappropriate muscle action, joint actions, tendon actions have to be at play. So the, you're right, 100%. The footwear basically just enables us to overreach, load areas of the feet we're not designed to load. In this belief that we're minimizing forces, you can't minimize the forces. They're still there. They have to yeah. still be there because you're still the ground reaction force is just the same. You're yeah. still dealing with two times body weight. It just masks it, yeah. um, which ultimately will affect the shape that you're running in. Amazing. And the other, the other thing I just want to quickly grasp it there is, is within running and refinement, there's rewilding feet, there's rewilding posture, and there's rewilding the technique, right? Just the shape of it, the correct cadence and what it looks like. And then you've got Patrick on next, which is breath work. Richie, I'm sure, has talked about breath work. But really running for me, the, the game changer as well is within breath work. But if you're going to bring nasal breathing into running, don't worry about what your heartbeat is and everything else. Just use breathing as your coach. Yeah. Allow the breath to teach you. So your breath will dictate the pace. If you find you have to start breathing in and out through your mouth, you're going too fast. Drop it back again. There might be fear in there about the, the mileage that you can cover or the, your pace dropping. And I started out last year... Um, at the beginning of the year, still mouth breathing, blowing out my ass and trying to get the mileage in. And I was at eight minute miles, right? To try and get the, the 30 miles a day that I needed. I switched to nasal breathing in February. And within 
a six week period, I, I dropped off at the beginning of nasal breathing to 10 minute miles. So I've gone from eight minute miles to 10 by, by a six week cycle of nasal breathing consistently every day. I got back down to, out, down to eight minute miles. And what came through nice. that is I remain in an aerobic state, but I also recover. So it meant, again, I could get up the next day and just go and repeat the same process. And also you take yourself, if you start working in tempos of breath and nasal breathing, you turn running from outside of a physical experience, which I always yeah. want it to be. I want it to be more of a connection to what would be an emotional experience, but also a spiritual experience, which running can be. It's not mm -hmm. just meant to be a doing principle. It's about a being. And that being has been doing that for 315,000 years, you know? Yeah. So how do we refine it? And the refinement will come through in rewilding the posture to where it was 315,000 years ago and rewilding the breath into 315,000 years. Yeah. So they're kind of the, that's, that's, that's the powerful journey I'm on right now. So hopefully that might help some, some of Amazing. you out there. Next door, if you start mowing the lawn, so I've brought you inside. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, just one quick question, a couple of questions coming through, Tony. Um, a couple of people asking about bunions. And for those people that are asking, we're going to save all of these to IGTV. So you're going to find all the, all the podcast live sessions from today on our feed. So don't worry, it's not going anywhere. You can watch it. Um, yeah, any advice on bunions? Yeah, so bunions, um, unfortunately with bunions, we have this um, conversation that comes through where, oh, yeah, the, my grandmother had them or my mother had them or my dad had them. They didn't. They just had the same footwear because you have to understand the bunion or the, that shape of foot is a symptom of the environment. So your footwear has created the bunion. You might have a predisposition for a short metatarsal head or a lax ligament, but only the environment of the foot will put it in a shoe shape. That's essentially what happens. The big toe drifts over the line, the axis of leverage goes over the axis of balance and we start to over pronate. And over time, you have to grow something new to stop you from completely collapsing in, which is a bunion, right? It's like a gorilla toe. Imagine that. It's like a new toe growing. Um, so first stage, exactly the same conversation as earlier. You have to remove the environment that's creating it. Because really in nature, the true environment of the human foot is nature alone, right? That's it. And we only had footwear for protection from the environment as in the temperatures, the climate really, right? Because the foot's incredible. It's just like every other sprinting animal. You'll develop pads over time. So with the foot exercises I've just taught you, go through all of those. You will change it. I've had some amazing results with bunions. Like people where the, the big toe is not actually it, we're overlapping the next toe next to it and a huge bunion out the side. I can't, you can't take the bunion away, right? But what you can do is bring the big toe back to where it should be. Because this calcification is a calcification. Once you have it, you can't change that really. It will stay. But you're almost at an advantage. You've created an extra support. So you then have, like, if you get the big toe where it should be, imagine you've got a support here, a support here, and the smaller toes. So it's a fantastic position to be in if you get the big toe where it needs to be. And the way you can do that is through the toe drills I've just taught you, rewilding the feet, and also the broom work. It will just start to help drift that or open that first knuckle up again. But it's all gonna, you won't succeed unless you deal with your footwear. There's, there's no shortcuts, right? You have to get rid of the environment that's causing it, causing the symptom. And again, no one's born with that symptom. We have the most incredibly wide open feet. And the feet up until puberty is a really soft ligamentous structure. But everywhere, every pair of footwear you see in most shoe shops will just be too narrow. Socks also are another biggie. You have to go up a size almost in your socks and make sure that the toe box is nice and loose. If the stitching on the toe box is tight, it will pull the toes in again. The next thing is just these and just, again, if you've got wide enough footwear, you'll be able to get these in. And they, they, they might feel a little bit uncomfortable to begin with. Back again, Tim. Got you. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Got you. Yeah, I had a bit of a pause there. So, um, I think they're called, I think they're by Valgo Fit. Valgo, Valgo Fit. Fit. I'll send you a link. I'll send you yeah. a link. Maybe you can put it in the show notes. We'll stick in the comments. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, if if you want to, guys, if you want to head to my website, um, TonyRiddle.com, there's a whole thing on tutorials there, like online tutorials. There's a rewilding feet one, there's a ground living one, there's a squatting one, there's a running one. So all that stuff that we've just kind of 
touched upon, it's all there, and you can play with those tutorials, really. Um, yeah. If people are interested in footwear, I know, I know you do some work with Vivo. Um, I've got a pair of Vivo trail running shoes. I, I, I live in them now. I don't want to wear anything else, and I've gone from having some other shoes, but they're, they're just, once you've spent some time with them, the, feet, the foot just feels so much freer. And the interesting thing is when you go back to a normal pair of shoes, like it, they're uncomfortable. Oh, it feels feel horrible, right? right? It feels <laughs> horrible. And again, you know, there's, there's many brands out there. I just think Vivo have been in the game for a long period of time now. And, um, and they've gone beyond kind of the training wear. You know, it's because, again, if you're only wearing a gym shoe, but then you're wearing casual wear or your office wear, you need to address that stuff because that's what you're spending 80 to 90% of your day in. You know, it's not like hunter-gatherers are wearing office shoes and then taking them off for, you know, <laughs> an hour or two of persistent hunting. It's, it's, it's the daily wear. In fact, you're probably better off doing it that way, sorting out the daily wear and then also less attention to what you're training in because, again, it will be a, the foundation stuff is in the majority of the day. Um, yeah. And then if, you're, if the locomotive stuff and the groundwork, Try and get as naked as in back to nature as you can. So barefoot for most of the training, especially if you're at home. I mean, there's absolutely no point. Get your feet out as much as you can. Yeah. Just quick ones on if you're working from home, take the desk and the chair down to the ground. Again, you know, if you're out in an office environment, you can't take any responsibility for that environment. It's not yours to deal with. Whereas in the home, you have complete control. So take responsibility for the stuff you can take responsibility for. And working from home is a big one. Why spend eight hours in a chair when you can spend eight hours on the ground mobilizing and offering movement? There's a chemical metabolic cost for being on the ground, as in I keep having to move shapes. I gain mobility, flexibility, and strength. There's a study on the Hadza that suggests that they're just as sedentary as we are, right? So they sit just for as long as we are. It's just the way they sit. They don't have chairs, right? They sit on the ground the whole time, always squatting, always kneeling. So if you have issues with mobility, well, don't sit in a chair. Go take it to the ground. And what, what you'll find is when you take that and you put it to your standard practice, that could be any sport, it could be any discipline, you're just going to upgrade it. You're going to upgrade your whole human experience by taking things back to the ground. It sounds, yeah. sounds a bit woo-woo, that, but it really does. It, it just will alter everything. Well, just suddenly you're like, oh, wow, that niggle's gone or this is gone. I had a piece in the Independent recently, and the journo contacted me um, because the very fact that she basically discovered me and was now basically taking things back to the ground, gave up her expensive ergonomic chair and found that her back pain went just by working from the ground. Yeah. And that, that could even be Netflix binging. You know, you can be kneeling, shin boxing, squatting, um, L sitting, <laughs> straddles, um, long sit. You can just keep behave. You can keep changing from one to the other. How long do we have, Tim? Like, no time. <laughs> ah, bugger. I was gonna go, I was gonna throw some more in. No, that's cool. Mate, we're gonna have to do Jacko is coming on at three or two, sorry. So we're gonna have to cool. wrap it up. There's a ton of questions in there, but obviously people can get in touch with you. They're, they're gonna find you on a across social, YouTube channel, website. Um the, the the comments have been great, mate. Everyone's really enjoyed it. I think seeing found it super valuable. So thank you so much for uh, for giving us an hour of your time and going through and sharing your wisdom, mate. It's been brilliant. Great man, great to be on here. You guys are doing amazing work, and I'm um, well done for putting it together. Yeah, no worries. Mate. Thank you for that. And uh, hopefully, we'll be able to catch it at some point when we're allowed back into normality. Well, normality. Yeah, we man. Get back to normal, but you know. Yeah, we can <laughs> all we can all hug and fist bump and stuff like that. It'd be amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then we'll go for a run. Yeah, yeah. we do that. We do that. We do that. I'm going to sign off then. All right.